Indie horror is a genre of games, films, and books that has always had a different, unexplainable draw to it. There's something about the translations of the fears of one mind, of one creator, into their respective forms of media that make us feel feelings that we've never thought were possible and experience a style of dread that is covered with traces of intimacy. I follow this artist named Skullflesh, and it's almost as if in every single piece we're just like spectators peering into someone else's nightmares with strange specific fears that have been realized through the same people and characters, which leads us to imagine a world of perpetual, dreadful agony for these characters. So their nightmares take shelter in our brains, and they start to morph. We've seen this inexplicable attraction to the indie subgenre manifest countless times over, with the indie counterparts in the genre having a way more culture-defining influence on us than the big-budget high productions ever could. When it comes down to me personally, when I think of indie media or media that basically has a smaller team working on it, I think of manga which for the most part is storyboarded, drafted, and drawn by one single person. And furthermore, when I think of manga and horror, of course I think of the GOAT, Junji Ito. But why is he the GOAT at this? Why does he scare us so much? And most importantly, what is the origin of this panel? Also, this panel. This one too, also that one. It just keeps on going. Junji Ito is most notable for his imagery that conveys sometimes cosmic dread, sometimes mortal dread, and sometimes fear of the unknown Lovecraftian dread, amongst several other more specific fears that eventually got him to build his own niche fanbase, until that niche fanbase became not niche anymore, because he's by far the most iconic Japanese horror author in Japan right now, who's actively been publishing work for the past 35 years. So when I was thinking about the creation of this video, I was like, oh, I get to reread my favorite classic Junji Ito stuff, and also familiar myself with his lesser known stuff and maybe unearth some gems and then I made by far the greatest mistake I'd make in the production of this video I did a seemingly innocent Google search and I found this This video would be the toughest undertaking I'd ever attempt to accomplish. It'd be a long and arduous process, but it would be worth And then I found out that almost half of his works were just lost media, only really published in Halloween magazines in the 1980s. I also suffer from a disease called broke, so I couldn't just purchase every single Junji Ito book. I only actually have 2 out of 25 of all of his books, so that's when the content pool was cut in half. And also there were some actually a lot of his one shots that I could only describe as bizarre. Not even good bizarre, just kind of weird for the sake of being weird. And I believe that the point of these videos is to shine some light on lesser known works while also highlighting the writer's growth. But these are like, not to insult Junji Ito, I've got a mad respect for the man, but it seems like in his earlier stages, he didn't have much of an idea of his style of horror. So ultimately, the way I decided to structure this video was that since a lot of his published books were just collections of his various pools of one-shots, I decided to take out the most notable chapters of each book and rank them like that. Obviously, his books that follow one narrative, I'll just cover that whole story. One shots receive a full spoiler warning and for the longer stories, spoilers for every first and second chapter. And quick disclaimer, these rankings are all opinion, but take good note that it's my opinion, so there's no challenging it. Let's talk about some manga. The Devil's Logic was a one shot published in Blood Bubble Logic, which is a collection of his very, very old one shots. And it's about a dude that places his audio recording in a girl's backpack that coincidentally takes her own life. And he listens to what actually happened before this tragic event to see how she got to that point. But then he too is possessed by the same thing that possessed the girl and he takes his own life also. The story is like 10 pages long I swear. It seems a little incomplete in my opinion. It has some good ideas but I think Ito just had trouble forming those ideas into a story back in 1988. Most of the chapters in this book are... Eh... 
meh. But looking on the bright side, something that's a dramatic improvement on the short form horror style is the sad tale of the principal post, which is an extra chapter added at the end of Gyo, and it tells the story of a big family living in a big house that they just recently bought. They were celebrating the purchase of their house when they noticed that the breadwinner of the family, the dad, is missing. They hear his voice shouting for help and finally locate him. He's underneath the floorboards and he was being crushed by the weight of the post. This story could represent a lot. Suppose that this man gave his entire life to support his family. This foundation or post was weighing down on his being as he was the foundation of his family. This story could also represent me. Every game when I'm carrying my team in Overwatch 2. Or it could have an interpretation in the realm of Japan's overworking problem but that kind of seems like a little bit of a stretch. Honestly, this feels like someone one day just challenged Junji Ito to make an authentic horror manga in under 10 pages, and then he's like, okay, and makes in four. The fact that he can even pull off this unsettling situation like this in such a wildly short runtime is just jaw-dropping. Biohouse is actually Junji Ito's second ever manga he has published, with the first being volume one of Tomoe back in 1987. It was published later in his collection of one-shots called Slug Girl, and apparently a biohouse is a house usually made of leftover agricultural products like straw, grass, etc. And I bet you're wondering, how does Junji Ito utilize a biohouse in his hit one-shot, Biohouse? Well, I'm glad you asked. The fuck does this have to do with the biohouse? So biohouse is about this couple of weirdos that enjoy a feast on some Gordon Ramsay tier food for a hobby, which includes crickets, snakes, lizards, and apples. Why, why, is, why is this here? It looks so out of place. So yeah, they're indulging in some fine cuisine when the guest of that household realizes that the glass the hostess poured is his own blood, which probably creeped her out more than those dreaded apples. So she runs off and the man chases her because he wants her to drink his blood. This one shot is really disturbing, sometimes pretty goofy, but it's an enjoyable read overall. And I'm honestly impressed that even this far back, Junji Ito had a pretty good standard of quality. Face Burglar is a one shot also published in a collection of one shots, but this time it's called Museum of Terror. And it's about a creature that attends school, and just like my great personality, this creature can choose to steal the faces of anyone it comes into contact with. With its end goal being to steal the face that will impress its crush. But this thing isn't human. It shouldn't even be attending school. So one day, in a coordinated effort, the entire student body decides to wear masks so it's forced to revert to its original alien complexion. To me, this is scary because it's actually kind of relatable. As someone who's just the culmination of a mass of random unrelated things that inspired him, it would be deeply horrid if everything that made me who I am was taken away from me. Oshikiri Eden is a story about this kid named Oshikiri, what a shock, and it tells the story of him in a bunch of questionably related chapters that are all technically part of the same canon because of our main character. So honest, after reading all of them, it's kind of like at one moment you're reading this meticulously crafted tragic eulogy of this man's career, and then other times you get works of questionable quality. It's like one chapter you're reading Berserk and the next you're reading like Boku no here academia okay it's not that bad but you get it It has fluctuating standards of quality my favorite chapter that i will point out is hallucinations which is really good as a standalone chapter but that's all i'm gonna say about this because we honestly have better stuff to go over approval or permission is a one shot that i found on the internet in questionable quality and it does tell an interesting story but not exactly beholden to the horror genre per se our main character is trying to ask for approval from his girlfriend's dad to marry her but no matter what the dad never budges disheartened he effectively breaks up with this girl and then falls in love with his co-worker but at the same time of this he is rolled back into asking the original girl for marriage by her brother and after 13 years of asking to get married, this guy is tired of simping, so he spikes the drink of the father with lethal poison. He never gets caught, but the important part is that on his deathbed, the father reveals that his daughter actually killed herself since our main character first decided to leave her, and that they've been seeing her ghost for the past 13 years. This is definitely a story. I'm glad that Ito is really committed to telling a narrative here. The thing that drifted ashore is, is great to me for a lot of reasons. It's one of Junji Ito's one-shots that I think accomplishes what it sets out to relay and ends when it needs to. Just solid all around. 
If you're curious and don't plan on reading it, this manga focuses on the thing that washed ashore. Well, obviously, but it emphasizes the real phobia of the fear of the deep sea. By presenting us this grotesque, mutated ocean creature, and also hints that there may be more creatures out in the ocean. But then it's revealed that it's carrying a huge quantity of live humans inside its stomach. But how was it that they were able to survive in the intestines of this nightmarish creature for years on end? Well, the only answer anyone could come up with is that the humans were basically leeching off of the monster like parasite. This changes perspective. If humans are capable of being literally parasitic with this monster, then who are the real monsters? And I like this one shot for asking this very question. Dissolving Classroom is a book that Junji Ito released with some one shots, but the one that's on the cover of the book I think does very well in portraying the style and the quality of the rest of the chapter. Chapter 1 of Dissolving Classroom introduces Kieko and a transfer student named Aziri. The interesting thing about this transfer student is that he apologizes for literally everything. He apologizes for bumping someone else's shoulders in the halls. He apologizes for breathing in someone else's oxygen. And he even apologizes for not drinking enough toilet water when bullies were drowning him. Our main protagonist, Kieko, sees this and is intrigued. She makes friends with him to find out that he's not a bad guy, just a little weird. Then long story short, she follows him home one day to open the door and meet this angel. She's actually Aziri's sister, and she warns Kieko about her brother, then, and that apparently his apologies makes people's brain turn to mush. She didn't believe her, given the devilish looks she gave, until she saw this. A lot of the chapters of this book of Dissolving Classroom are good, and I definitely recommend giving them a read. I just couldn't find a lot of the chapters online, to be real with you. Scarecrow is a one-shot where one day, a father realized that if he placed a scarecrow next to the grave of his now-deceased daughter, it would eventually grow to look like how she once did. He and some of the locals came to believe her spirit had taken shelter inside the scarecrow. Then others started doing the same thing, but with their deceased friends and family. And by the end, it's revealed that the scarecrows were actually possessed with the dead spirits when one of the scarecrows met its murderer, and it contorted its look, leaped and coldly impaled him. This was a pretty fun read, but there's actually another chapter I'd like to highlight from Face Burglar. Honorable Ancestors is a one-shot that features some of the most detailed and iconic imagery out of all of Junji Ito's history, but the story takes so many twists and turns itself that I'd feel bad spoiling it. So if you like what you see here, check out this one. Censor is a Junji Ito book that covers a cohesive story, but in my brain whenever I try to recount the events, it seems like anything but cohesive. But in reality, that's just my brain. This story represents so many concepts, so many ideas, that I found it hard to summarize why to read Censor in this short pop review format. So I'm not even going to describe any of the events that happen, but just try to convey the essence of this work. Censor borrows a lot of concepts from mostly Judeo-Christian scriptures, and also some symbolism originating from classical Japanese Buddhism. It's as if this was a complete retelling of the events of the New Testament, shifted to an East Asian perspective. But some things are different. The main symbolism for a god's blessing is hair. Hair that when humans grasp it can allow superhuman feats to be achieved, like telepathy and gaining access to secret hidden knowledge usually kept from humanity. But every single time a group of people have access to this power, they either get completely eviscerated by natural causes or they go insane leaving the only ones left being two mediators, one representing one god and one representing another. The god of light, or the Abrahamic god, and the god of jet black, or the devil. Though these two mediators don't even care for spreading their beliefs. One just wants to be a god and the other wants to know why she was chosen. It's just the ones who are chosen who go after each other and try to kill each other. I don't know exactly why this scares me. Maybe because it kind of just twists fundamental facts and values of Christian beliefs in an unsettling way which I was raised with. Or just has scary pictures, either one.
Soichi's beloved pet starts out when an ordinary family decides to adopt a stray cat. Soichi is part of that family and he's, well, maniacal. And over time he starts hanging out with the cat. His bad vibes influence the poor cat and that's where this panel was produced. Very good stuff. But the best part is that this cat turns back to normal in the end. And it's funny because this is like the one one shot that Junji Ito created that ends with a happy ending. And it was to save a cat. This is, this is so Denji of Junji Ito. Dissection Girl starts out in a dissection room filled with medical students who are given the chance to study the human body through real humans. But once they start dissecting, they realize something wrong with one of the bodies. Something warm. One of the bodies is clearly alive and that person, once they found out that they've been exposed, begs the students to dissect her. She is not well in the head. And she resorts to crazier and crazier places and people to get dissected. Eventually she does, but not by any medical professional. Eventually, many years later, at the same medical dissection area, the dissection girl shows up again, except she's not a girl anymore. And she also has what looks like scars from several past dissections. And also, this one more thing, she's actually dead this time. So they dissect her and they find this. If I were a med student and I came across this manga, I, ne I never forgive Ito. Frankenstein is a work by Junji Ito, and it was later adapted into a book by Mary Shelley. But seriously, after not reading the original for like forever, this adaptation gave me a fresh new take on the classic Frankenstein. There's not too much to it, if you like the original and like Junji Ito's style, this is a no-brainer. So the stories I've already covered are good, don't get me wrong, but they're not anything like the stories in the second half of this video. This marks where, beyond this point, I'd recommend all of these stories. The Long Dream is one of his most interesting one-shots. Ito writes about a man that has an unheard of condition where he would experience long stretches of time in his dreams, to the point where he starts out staying inside his dreams for a whole month of made up reality his subconscious would fabricate, but then he starts dreaming about years in his made up world then decades. In reality, all these time warped manifestations occur in less than a day, but nonetheless, he has experienced these decade long events. Even if they're made up, he truly did feel that fake joy, cry those fake tears, fall in a youthful fake love. So after all of this, his appearance started to change. It began to look deformed. But not because of the dreams themselves, no, I think it's something else. It's the realization after waking up that everything was a lie that placed strain on his very being. Then this emotional stress manifested physically. This story could be interpreted several ways, but I think one of the more simpler explanations has the best answers. It just tackles the real and legitimate fear of going to sleep knowing there's a possibility that you may not wake up. Iwasaki is having a bad premonition about nothing specifically. He just knows that something bad will happen. Whatever he feels is coming, he tries his best to avoid, and in the midst of trying to do exactly that, he sits himself in a coffee shop and randomly flips through a magazine when he sees something abnormal. An abnormally tall, abnormally long-faced woman with abnormally sharp and beastly features. The fact that he's seeing this thing in a magazine confuses him greatly, because obviously whatever this thing is, it doesn't conform to the typical beauty standards of the rest of the magazine. It's unsettling, it's bizarre, and it's not just how ugly this thing is that made him unable to sleep at night, it was also because it was coupled with the contrasting beauty of the models around it. The thing that irked him was how he and only he saw this as strange, and how everyone else acted as if this was normal. This is fashion model. It's a one shot that scares me, but I found it so hard to explain that the only way I can find to relay this horror is by reading it yourself. I recommend it a lot. Apparently, 
there was a quite large fault that formed because of an earthquake of great magnitude, the epicenter of that earthquake being on Amargara Mountain. But this was a big deal. For some reason, swabs of people started congregating at this fault because of curiosity, since the fault itself imposed an apprehensive anxiety. It had human-shaped holes dug into its frame that were so deep, science had no explanation for how these complex structures were even conceived. For a lot of people, this apprehension they felt upon closer inspection morphed into a chilling captivation, as they all realized that each of these holes were made to fit one specific person. For some strange reason, people by the masses started sinking into the holes, never to be seen again. The holes were so deep that rescuers considered them dead upon taking a glance on the situation. But come a few months later, scientists discovered a fault on the other side of the mountain, and they found out that they were still alive. I love this one shot personally. There are so many ways of interpreting the events that happen in it, and that's why I find it to be so phenomenal. But personally, the reason I think this scares me so much is because those holes represent every single individual's desire to be defined. Defined by personality, defined by status, or defined by shape. Through this definition, we force ourselves into an ever-changing box of several different perspectives. That's just me. I know there's a lot of interpretations for this one. If you have your own, I'd love to see them in the comment. comment. Black Paradox is a book by Junji Ito, and it might be his work that does the best job in making you shudder at its sheer implications, which is packed with so much symbolism and perspectives that it's hard to even come up with one interpretation for it. So to give an oversimplified summary of Black Paradox, it happened that one day, four individuals decided that they were fed up with unfairly treated or terrified by their own existence. Everyone gives their reason for coming together on that day, and coincidentally, every single person's reason has to do with a doppelganger, another self that was put on this earth to haunt them. But then they look out the window and see this, the same car with the same people in it. Doubt and fear sinks in, and as they proceed, they find that amongst themselves, there may be imposters mixed in with the real one. They fight with each other until they reveal who the true ones really are. So they came out here with one goal, and none of them even came close to completing it. So, take two. They all drive to the place they intend on dying in. Though, as they commence, there's this weird air of suspicion. Something is wrong. All but one person fakes it. But this one person doesn't die, but he throws up an ethereal gemstone. Though I would definitely want to make a more in-depth analysis, I think part of the horror is making your own interpretations and thinking about the story from a more personal perspective. But I, I love this one. The Hanging Balloons is a one-shot that starts out with Kazuko holding up in her room because of something trying to kill her from the outside. It's using her voice to try to lure her out, but she's not fooled by it. But first, I want you to read this manga and tell me in the comments what you thought about it. Because to me, it was really fucking goofy. Apparently, these were the monstrosities lying in wait outside. Inflated heads that were blown up like balloons and, and nooses latched onto the bottom. But the thing is, is that the heads are the faces of the real people. And they, for some reason, chase down whoever that person is to hang them. And for me, it's, it's here when at first glance, this goofy and kind of bizarre drawing transformed into something much more paralyzing with its implications. That's an important word to keep in mind. Fear by implication might be one of Ito's greatest ways of conveying his terror. This is great stuff. I personally love horror that's communicated through silly ideas, but that's only when looking at them from the surface level. No Longer Human is one of Junji Ito's longer works, and that's actually because it's his second adaptation. But this time, it covered something not as culture-defining as Frankenstein. 
I mean, well, it kind of is. The book it's based on, No Longer Human, is the second highest selling book in Japan by Usumu Daizai. And I read it. It's a stunning book, which basically tells the story of someone who's broken, who has been born with something missing from his brain that makes him think and see society differently. The book does a wonderful job at describing what goes on in our main character's head, who's basically a psychopath. Junji Ito's adaptation tells a more event-driven story that adds a wonderful flavor, with just beautiful panels capturing the pure terror going on in our protagonist's head. I actually liked this adaptation more than the book, and the reason I went the extra mile and read the book beforehand was because I actually made a whole ass video on the original and the adaptation, but that didn't go too well. But I love this, honestly. No Longer Human simultaneously became one of my favorite books and adaptations of all time. Intersection fortune telling or sujura is a type of Japanese fortune telling where you stand on some sort of crosswalk and ask the first person you see at the intersection to tell your fortune. Well, in the intersection's pretty boy, we're situated in a town that's especially foggy. This obfuscation stages the ideal conditions for intersection fortune telling, and naturally a lot of young people have gravitated towards it. But apparently there is a man that some engaging in this practice will meet by chance. A tall, mysterious, and attractive looking boy. Basically, how the game works is that the person standing at the intersection will ask someone crossing to answer their question with whatever response surfaces in their head first. And the problem lies with this, the thought that surfaces first hand. What if that thought is something that you don't want to hear? What if it's something that you can't hear? Every single time anyone is confronted with the man, he'd tell a bad fortune and that fortune would always manifest itself, and eventually that person he'd relay his fortune to would commit suicide. This is my favorite type of Junji Ito story, where it covers an extremely niche fear, but as the story is fleshed out, it's clear that this fear isn't niche at all. It could probably apply to all of us in some way, shape, or form. Also, the way in which this fear is presented as like a faded memory, storyboarded on a foggy, forgettable night, adds an ironically unforgettable aesthetic. Tomoe was actually Junji Ito's first recorded published work, but throughout the years he'd sparingly go on to add more chapters to the series when it eventually ended after 24 years. That's, that's insane. Starting in 1987 and ending in 2011 with long, usually episodic chapters that have one thing in common, Tomoe. So this information is important because it stages the sheer value of this serialization to see from chapter to chapter truly exponential growth, specifically because there may be several months or even several years between the release schedule of these chapters. Also, just to be clear, I've taken into account the earlier and admittedly less quality chapters into the rankings of Tomoe. It's only fair to rate it based on the whole package. So yeah, that's why it's here. But Tomoe, who's been the star for over 20 years now, starts out dead. Nobody knows the killer, but what they do know is that somehow her body has been maimed, eventually fragmented, and then finally scattered to different distant places. Tomoe is gone, and her best friend Waiko is grieving along with the rest of her class. That is, until Tomoe just shows up to school for the next day. No one actually knows what the hell is going on. The only sane explanation anyone could come up with is that this new Tomoe is a zombie or some kind. And when questioned about anything, Tomoe would avoid answering and insist on acting like normal. But to people who've known the original Tomoe, she was acting as anything but normal. Anyone who'd interact with her, she tried to seduce them. When trying to seduce the teacher of the class, a fight broke out involving another boy, and eventually it ended up in Tomoe falling to her death. Immediately, every person in the class strategizes on the best way to cover up the murder, and they decided to repeat what had been done originally. They cut up her body, and made every single person hide a random body part. After some time, word of her second death settles, until she shows up a third time. 
Tomoe wreaks havoc in her area. Anyone that comes into contact with her transitions into an obsessed stupor. And most strangely, every single time someone falls in love with her, they end up being controlled by the unrelenting desire to kill her and do unspeakable things to her corpse. And the cycle spins back around when this only causes her to multiply and produce more tomoes, with her first instinct being seducing completely random men for the fun of it. But this description is good at explaining the plot of Tomoe, but it doesn't even come close to describing how this manga fills you with dread. How the formulaic chapters of this manga still always somehow draw you in. And for that, I'll need to spoil chapter 7 of the manga. It's a great chapter, so if you want to read it, I totally understand. So chapter 7 introduces us to a rescue team who's traversing the snow-layered mountains to find one of the team member's brothers. But then they come across a discarded body shoved into a hole carved into a mountain. Upon closer inspection, she's alive. It's Tomoe. The crew bundles her up and takes her to their shelter when, in the midst of a furious blizzard, she speaks. Upon hearing her desire, one of the men takes off all of his clothes in order to appease her. But due to the sheer conditions he put up with for the sake of Tomoe, his sanity starts to combust faster than any other. And within minutes, he snapped into a jealous frenzy. But he couldn't kill her. With one man left in abject isolation, the only thing on his mind isn't the likes of Tomoe or any of his friends. It was saving his brother. Though, when Tomoe tried to seduce him, he claimed that he killed her by accident. The boy attempted to look for another area to camp out when he found his brother's corpse being devoured by Tomoe. The dread of this manga isn't Tomoe, per se. The dread is the virus she inflicts upon others, the insanity, the obsession she creates, and eventually over the course of the story, we begin to discover more and more knowledge about Tomoe's nature. But nobody ever even comes close to the point where they understand Tomoe. She always remains a mystery. This manga has a phenomenal middle and end, but the beginning always had me a little conflicted. Sometimes a lot of the narrative was a little confusing to understand due to the immature style of the paneling and also how some of Junji Ito's art in his earlier chapters didn't exactly age well. That's about it for Tomoe though. Gyo is one of Ito's longer works and it tells the story of Kaori and Tadashi, a couple that has been going through some rough patches. It seems like the flame of their relationship has been flickering and maybe dying out as of late. Located on the shores of Okinawa, the widespread nature of this stench of seafood has become all but the tolerable odor of normalcy. But Kaori smells something which even she could not bear to tolerate. It smelt like something was deteriorating right next to her, like some sort of rotting corpse was following her as the stench trailed behind. She took excessive showers, but even that didn't seem to cleanse herself of the smell. That's until she caught something at the corner of her eye. Under further investigation, this something was becoming more and more mysterious, until Tadashi found out what it really was. It's dead. It's rotten, but in spite of all of that, its strange extraterrestrial protrusions wiggled and reacted. This isn't the only one though. It seemed like the whole ocean is infested with these mutilated and grotesque fish. Soon all of Japan and then eventually the whole world became like this. The story is a mystery. A mystery built upon mysteries. Though, from the reader's perspective, it always seems like we're teetering on the edge of figuring and unraveling the one mystery presented to us. But then, only to be hit with the realization that this discovery only made us privy to the knowledge that we don't have any knowledge. In fact, the more we start to learn, the more the stakes build and build until... Well, I was gonna say we learn out everything about these abominations, but we actually are left in the dark about the true nature of these creatures, even at the end. And that simple fact that we're always left in the dark about things cements this as something that transcends a normal mystery thriller. It's a series that encloses you in darkness, gives bright but brief moments of light, but then that light never comes back and you're left wondering if that light will ever come back.
The world of Gyo will never know what hit them. And well, that's good for the world of Gyo, because if they did know, then it's obvious that there would be another patch of darkness after that discovery that spans across infinity. In other words, the horror of Gyo is nested in the fear of knowledge. If the God of Thunder isn't responsible for it thundering outside, then there must be an even more perplexing explanation for it happening. This perplexion is frightening, simply because the answer has the potential to be beyond our comprehension. Just like asking yourself, if the legs do have traces of consciousness inside of them, where did they come from? No answer. And that's what I love about Gyo. It answers the simpler and more basic questions, but leaves the most foreboding and existential ones to the imagination. There's not much to say about Uzumaki. I mean, there is a lot I can say, but I feel like it has already been said in many more in-depth analysis and whatnot. This is a staple of Junji Ito. When people think Junji Ito, they probably think Uzumaki. It has everything it can have to industry-leading artwork and paneling, a mysterious, frightening, and oddly metaphorical threat that the main cast is trying to fight. Uzumaki is his most notable work. I mean, I can't imagine that there'd be anyone that hasn't read this manga that clicked on this video. But there's something I think that's even better. Not to disqualify this manga's quality, but Remina just has everything. This is something I'd highly recommend. Hellstar Remina is a story that keeps pulling you into its world with actually genius subtle world building and character development. I emphasize character development because this manga executes on it in a very weird fashion, but starts to make more and more sense after reading why our main character Remina seems to not have any personality of her own. And while making sense of that, it also happens that you'd come across the answer to the most important question of what makes Ramina horrifying? To give a quick plot synopsis, Ramina is the daughter of a scientist that has recently discovered a new planet, and he decides to name it after his own daughter. Ramina receives a lot of spotlight because of it, and at first, she didn't want to be associated with it at all, but eventually she decides to go with it. But it wasn't until it was found out that actually this planet called Ramina is flying on course to intercept Earth that people get scared. People began rioting in the streets, and Remina, the person, took the blame. And then upon the final moments of the earth, the populace grow more and more deranged, trying to hunt down Remina in belief that her passing will save them. This manga portrays a spiral of madness and human insanity, but it also spirals into another spiral of cosmic indescribable aberrations. And this is all being told from the perspective of someone who really doesn't have a presence personality-wise. And that's the key to this manga's horror. It's terror caused by being told from the perspective of someone so tiny they might as well be an ant, but also simultaneously so important that they're at the center of all the madness and terror. This manga is more Lovecraftian than Lovecraft and every single panel and page of art thoroughly impresses me. I truly love doing these videos. I wish I could actually read all of Junji Ito's works, but the stars didn't exactly align for that. So after finishing this video, if I could give a label to describe Junji Ito's style, I'd say that his horror lies in the exploitation of perspective, where things are as they seem, but Ito still uses that against you. Therefore, it's expected, but the horror doesn't originate from the shock of the events, but by its implications. That's why I place such an importance on the interpretations of his work. That is basically the horror. I personally love making these videos. Every time I do make one, I become a way bigger fan of the mangaka. If you have any other suggestions on which mangaka to make a video on next, I'd be happy to consider them in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and consider subscribing. If not, a dislike and a comment. All feedback is helpful. Oh, by the way, I have a Twitter now. Alright, that's it. See ya.